This is my eighth video in my AP Biology review series, and it is about the cell cycle, so interphase and mitosis. Let's start with some vocabulary. Genome is a cell's DNA. Chromosomes is packaged DNA. It makes cell division more manageable. It's made of chromatin, which is DNA and associated proteins. It's in the stringy form as chromatin. Somatic cells are all body cells except the reproductive cells. They're made by mitosis and each have two N chromosomes, N chromosome from each parent. Gametes are reproductive cells. They're made by meiosis, which I won't really talk about in this video, but I'll include in the next video. And each have N chromosomes. Each duplicated chromosome has two sister chromatids, which are held together by a centromere. They will be separated and distributed to daughter cells. It's important to remember that cell cycle results in two identical daughter cells. Here's a chromosome before replication. Here's one after replication, but before division. And it has two sister chromatids and a centromere there in the middle. Interphase is the longest phase of the cell cycle, even though a lot of times uh, people refer to it as mitosis. Mitosis is really just a small portion of it. 90% of the cell cycle. DNA is in chromatin form, so it's stringy. G1 phase is a phase in which the cell grows and organelles are duplicated. Then the S phase is synthesis. Chromosomes are duplicated. G2 phase is more growth, making proteins and organelles and preparing for mitosis. Then there's the mitotic phase. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. The mitotic spindle forms during prophase, is made of microtubules and other fibers. It's important for the movement of chromosomes. Centrosomes are organelles that organize microtubules. So in this picture you can see they even call it a microtubule organizing center. That's its job. Kinetochore is a protein structure at the centromere. Each sister chromatid has one. Kinetochore microtubules attach to them during prophase. Polar microtubules go from pole to pole. So basically, when microtubules bind to a chromosome's kinetochore, the chromosome begins to move toward the pole from which the microtubule extended from. Microtubules from the other end will attach to the other kinetochore. Remember, each sister chromatid has one. The microtubules are pulling the chromosome in opposite directions and will settle mid in the middle, midway, in metaphase, which we'll talk about more in a few slides. Microtubules that are not attached to kinetochores are also forming during this time and will extend from one pole to the other. These are called the polar microtubules. After metaphase, a protein holding the two sister chromatids together is inactivated and anaphase will begin. The chromatids will be pulled apart by the shortening microtubules. non kinetochore microtubules are important in elongating the cell during cell division. So now for mitosis, but starting with G2 of interphase. DNA is in chromatin form, has already been duplicated. The centrioles are also duplicated, and centrioles are in chromosomes, sorry, in the centrosomes. Prophase is basically the first stage of mitosis. Nucleoli will dissolve. The chromatin will coil into chromosomes and the mitotic spindle starts to form. Then we have metaphase where the chromosomes will line up at the center of the cell at, at the metaphase plate. The metaphase plate is an imaginary plane down the middle of the cell and they're moved by spindle fibers. Anaphase is the phase in which sister chromatids are split apart. Each one becomes its own daughter chromosome. 
and they move toward opposite ends of the cell. Remember about the mitotic spindle we talked about earlier? No chromosomes are simply moving on their own. They're being moved by the mitotic spindle, which shortens and lengthens. Next, we have telophase, where daughter nuclei begin to reform and the chromosomes become less condensed. So telophase is basically the opposite of prophase. And this first picture with the pink, that is both telophase and cytokinesis, where the cy cytoplasm will divide. In animal cells, a cleavage furrow will form, which means the cells will pinch into two. In plant cells, a cell plate will form. So the cleavage furrow is a shallow groove near the metaphase plate. The contractile ring is made of proteins, forms an anaphase, and contracts as the cells divide. In plants, vesicles from the Golgi body move along the microtubules to form a cell plate. The vesicles have materials for the new cell wall in them. And plant cells will divide, each with their own plasma membrane and cell wall. Binary fission is the process bacteria undergo to reproduce. Most genes of a bacteria are on its single bacterial chromosome. However, sometimes there's also a plasmid, which is a small circular piece of DNA with a few genes. Some bacteria actually have several plasmids. But the chromosome is circular DNA with proteins. Copying DNA begins at the origin of replication, which is a specific place on the chromosome. The plasmid can also replicate on its own if it has an origin of replication. In this case, it does. If it doesn't have an origin of replication, it will be integrated into the cell's bacterial chromosome for replication. The steps, starting with the replication, which begins at the origin of replication. Then the origin will move toward the other end of the cell. The plasma membrane will grow inward and a cell wall will form. Then we'll have two daughter cells. It's believed that mitosis evolved from binary fission. Remember that prokaryotes existed on Earth long before eukaryotes. Research has shown that some proteins involved in binary fission are related to eukaryotic proteins. Cells at different stages of the cycle were fused together in an experiment around the 1970s, and this showed that signals in the cytoplasm control the progression of phases. So if you look at this picture, you can see that in experiment one, when a cell in the S phase was fused with one in the G1 phase, both cells were in the S phase. That means that there's some sort of signal in the cytoplasm that's causing that G1 phase um, to move into S when it, ha when it comes into contact with the signals from the other cell. And you can see in experiment two, something similar happened. We have one in the mitotic phase and one in G1. And when they're fused together, both go to, mitos to the mitotic phase. So this showed scientists that there are cytoplasmic signals that affect in what um, phase the cell is in. Regulation of the cell cycle. Cell cycle is regulated by a control system, controlled by signal molecules. There are checkpoints, which are places in the cycle where signals will make the cycle continue or stop. So in this picture, I have drawn the G1 checkpoint, G2, and M checkpoints. The signals are inside and outside of the cell, and we'll talk more about them in the coming slides. The G1 checkpoint is the most important checkpoint. A cell will go into the G0 phase if it does not receive the go-ahead at this point. This is a non-dividing state, but environmental cues can return the cell to the cycle. Most cells of the human body are actually in the G0 phase. Mature nerve and muscle cells are in this state forever. Other cells, such as liver cells, can return back to the cell cycle um, by external signals, such as growth factors that are released after an injury. Protein kinases are enzymes that activate other proteins by phosphorylating them. 
They give the go-ahead signals at the G1 and G2 checkpoints. They're present at a constant concentration in the cell. Cyclins are proteins whose concentration in the cell fluctuates. The kinases that regulate the cell cycle must be attached to a cyclin to be active, which is why they're called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. CDK activity is reliant on cyclin concentration. So as you can see in this picture, there are um, several different cyclins whose concentration will fluctuate throughout the cycle. In the next slide, we'll talk about one specific one. An example of a cyclin CDK complex is MPF, which stands for maturation promoting factor, but we're going to think of as M phase promoting factor. Cyclins that accumulate during the G2 phase of interphase will bind to kinases to form MPF. Enough MPF will allow the cell to pass the G2 checkpoint. MPF will initiate mitosis by phosphorylating other proteins. For example, it phosphorylates proteins that help break down the nuclear envelope. Remember, that happens in prophase. During anaphase, it will initiate a process to, de sorry, to destroy its own cyclin so that it turns off this whole process. The CDK will be reused. So if you look at the top picture, you can see, again, the cyclin's um, concentration fluctuates and is at its highest during mitosis. And if you look at the bottom picture, you can see the cycle. Cyclin will accumulate around the G2 checkpoint and will bind to the CDKs to form the MPFs, which will then um, phosphorylate proteins that help mitosis occur. But then after mitosis is over, the cyclin will be degraded, which basically turns itself off but then the cycle will continue as the cyclin concentration rises. There are also important internal external signals. Internal signals, for example, include during my, sorry, during metaphase, kinetochores are not attached to a spindle microtubule. And the ones that aren't attached will send out signal molecules that cause sister chromatids to stay together and delay anaphase. This makes sure that chromosomes are divided evenly. External signals can be chemical or physical. They include nutrients and growth factors. For example, platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF, is needed for fibroblasts cells to divide, and fibroblasts are um, cells in connective tissue. PDGF binds to receptors on the cells and triggers a signal transduction pathway, remember we talked a lot about that in the last video, that allows the cell to start dividing and then pass the G1 checkpoint. If an injury occurs, PDGF will be released by platelets to stimulate that cell division. More internal and external signals. Density-dependent inhibition is where crowded cells stop dividing because there's not enough nutrient to support more cell division. Anchorage dependence is exhibited by most animal cells. They must anchor to something else, for example, the extracellular matrix or the sides of a jar, to begin dividing. Cancer cells do not exhibit density-dependent inhibition or anchorage dependence. They cannot be properly regulated by the body's control system, which means they divide excessively. So this shows how important the regulation of the cell cycle is, because if we don't have that, then uncontrollable cell division can really harm the person. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe if you would like to see more videos.